Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gustav. And on behalf of the 99 NICU team, I would like to welcome you uh, all to the last of our four innovations webinars this spring. A series of webinars where we have been taking a look at new innovations shaping the future of neonatal care. These webinars have been designed to bring the latest in new innovations and technologies in neonatology, all sponsored by smaller startup companies and with guest speakers who are experts in their field. The format is a bit different today compared to our last webinars. We will start with a two minute short presentation from our partner, and then we'll have a 15 minute guest lecture delivered by a neonatal expert as usual. After that, the, you'll see a presentation about an innovative open source project, bringing neonatal care to patients in developing countries. A project that caught our attention from a post at the 99 NICU forum, and we got very interested in hearing more about it. So please, Vicky. Thanks, Gustav. Hello, everybody. I'm Vicky, um, part of the 99 NICU team, and I'm just going to introduce our um, sponsors and um, speakers to you. So today we'd like to welcome Neobiomics and Medical Open World, um, one of which Neobiomics is a, a small startup company and one NGO, um, med which is Medical Open World, um, who have partnered up for our fourth and final webinar. Um, and we are delighted um, to have, um, who some of you might know already, Dr. Stefan Johansson, um, and also um, from Medical Open World, um, Pablo Sanchez Bagasa. I hope I pronounced your name right. So welcome, Pablo, um, as our two guest speakers. So um, Stefan is a consultant neonatologist at Sachs Children's and Youth Hospital and an associate professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, through his academic affiliation in the Clinical Epidemiology Division, he's got a long experience of working in research projects um, based on large Swedish data sets in national registries. Um, and he's also got a bit of a track record as a social entrepreneur. Um, many of you will know him as the founder of 99 NICU um, back in 2006, but he's also founded Neobiomics, the startup company that we par partnered with for today. Um, and our second speaker is Pablo, so welcome, who is an electronic engineer um, working at, a tele at telecom companies, but he's also the leader of the Inthreator, I hope I pronounced that right too, project and is co-founder of the NGO Medical Open World. So we're really delighted to have um, an NGO um, to speak to, to us today, so welcome. Um, and like with all of our previous Neovations webinars, after we've heard from both of our guest speakers, we'll have a joint kind of Q&A. Um, so please put all your questions in the chat and then we'll put them to the panel um, at the end of both of the speakers sessions. So I think that's handing over to um, Frank from Neobiomics first, I think. Okay, thank you very much. So I will share my screen. Give you a very quick overview of how we are doing with Neobiomics. I'm the European sales manager and actually Neobiomics was um, it's a startup company founded in 2016, and it's a small focused team of experts in science, medicine, and entrepreneurship. And our dedication is actually in neonatology. As you can imagine, we're trying to find solutions for the neonatology field. And one of the solutions we have was PROPREMS and is PROPREMS, which was introduced in 2019. It's a food supplement in single portion packages. It has three good documented strains and it's actually good, safe and easy to use. I'm sure some of you know it. So that's our main product. That's our main solution we're providing to the community right now. But we're also looking into the future and we're looking at other solutions we would like to um, share with the community and provide to the community. And we want to take your attention to Neo Mega 36, and which will be available in September, October, so in the fall of 2023. It's a food supplement for special medical purposes of an FSMP. It's an arachidonic acid and a DHA. And that's something you can look forward in the fall of 2023. And um, to complete that, if you are interested in information about us, if you're interested in 
knowing more about Neobiomics and the team, please don't hesitate to get in touch. You can get in touch with me. I have a very easy email because it's frank at neobiomics.eu or any other people. And we are quite uh, present in uh, LinkedIn and all the other media. So you find us easily. So that was a very, very quick helicopter view of uh, Neobiomics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please go ahead, Stefan. Thank you. So now wish me luck that my screen sharing is working. Yes. <laughs> uh, so can you now see the introduction slide? Everything looks perfect. Perfect. Uh, so thank you so much for the introduction earlier and uh, uh, if you would like to get in touch with me about uh, this topic, please send me an email or message on social media or LinkedIn. you find my contact information below. <coughs> uh, as already declared, I would also like to declare my conflicts of interest, uh, being the founder of 99IQ back in 2006. And I'm also the founder and the CEO of Neobiomics, the company that is partnering up with this webinar. Now, let's come to the topic of APGA scoring, uh, named after the fabulous woman and neonatologist Virginia Apgar, a clinician and researcher who was working at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and later also with the uh, March of Dimes. Uh, she published uh, a classical paper back in 1953 where she proposed a scoring system to assess the immediate uh, status of newborn infants, uh, a scoring system that later got her name. <clears throat> uh, the APCAR score is used uh, globally and in very different contexts throughout the world. <clears throat> uh, however, there are a number of limitations to this scoring system. It is uh, subjective. Two people may score the same sign differently. And uh, one also needs to acknowledge that the APCAR score was never developed to uh, to look into longer term risks. Um, the, <laughs> oh, sorry. the American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't think too highly about the APCAR score. Uh, uh, they made a statement back in 2015 where the AAP writes that we need to recognize its limitations and that the APCAR score doesn't predict individual outcomes. Uh, with this presentation, I hope to give a somewhat different perspective. Uh, as you know, there are many scoring systems around, SNAP, SNAPE, CRIB, etc. <clears throat> uh, but I think that the APCAR score is still a valid scoring system. And I would, li would like to show you some data in term and also focus later on preterm infants. Uh, supporting uh, the value of, pre of APCAR scoring. <clears throat> so let's start with the term uh, scoring. Um, actually, the APCAR score was proposed to be a tool for assessing short term or even immediate well being of term infants. Uh, so let's see how it is associated with risks in term infants. Uh, this is uh, now a relatively old paper. It was published uh, 2001 in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, but it clearly demonstrates that in term infants, the risk of neonatal death is related to the five minute APCAR score, which is, as you know, not uh, surprising. <clears throat> Uh, a project from our research group at the Clinical Epidemiology Department at Karolinska also shows that the APGAR score is related to morbidity. Uh, by using a cohort of 1.2 million term infants, of which um, 1,200 later got a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, 
uh, it was found that both the five and 10 minute scores were inversely related to the risk to develop cerebral palsy later. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful infographic from the publication in British Medical Journal <clears throat> showing how changes between the five and 10 minute scores impacted the risk. And the reference group is um, uh, infants with both with nine to 10 points at both five and 10 minutes. If you look at the five minute score of seven to eight, uh, you can see that in infants with an improved score up to nine to 10 at 10 minutes, those infants had a doubled risk, while those with the same score of seven to eight at both five and 10 minutes had a fivefold risk, suggesting that if the score improves, there is an impact in risk. Uh, the second message with this uh, infographic is that a score of seven or higher is commonly regarded as like a normal score. But this cohort study clearly demonstrates that that is not the case, at least when it comes to the risk of cerebral palsy. And thirdly, a low score of both at both five and 10 minutes is strongly associated with a high risk of cerebral palsy. <clears throat> so while APGAR scores are associated with both mortality and morbidity in term infants, what about preterm infants? As you know, their immaturity at birth make APGAR scoring more challenging. Uh, we wanted to address this question in a large <clears throat> uh, study based on Swedish national registers. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just need to have a sip of water. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to address this question in a large study uh, where we utilized information uh, in the Swedish national registers. Uh, uh, we have a Swedish personal identification number, and uh, this is used for recording data in national registers. And through this number, it's possible to link individual information from several register sources. Uh, in all, there was uh, 2.5 million singleton Liborns uh, uh, born over a 24 year period from 92 to 2016 of which 125,000 was born preterm before 37 weeks. Uh, we excluded infants with malformations. <clears throat> so the study population included 113 preterm infants. Uh, we had uh, a five minute APGAR score available uh, for 98% of those. Uh, the analysis I will show were, were uh, adjusted for number of key covariates. <clears throat> For example, maternal age and body mass index, birth weight for gestational age, mode of delivery, and also hospital level. And the outcome in our study was neonatal mortality, so death before 28 days. Uh, first, we plotted mortality rates by gestational week. And as expected, there was a strong inverse relation, ranging from 0.2% in 36-weekers to 76% in 22-weekers. Next, we wanted to look into mortality by APGAR scores at five minutes. And when we plotted rates per individual score from zero to 10, uh, we found a strong inverse relation, ranging from 0.2% in, uh, in infants with 10 points at five minutes to 70% mortality in preterm infants with zero to one uh, points. <clears throat> so in the next step, we wanted to, uh, to disentangle the risks when both APGAR score and gestational age was taken into account. And to do this, we stratified the analysis by gestational age. 
And uh, to, to avoid um, uh, overcrowding by figures, I will only show a subset of the results here. Uh, so to begin with, in the stratum of 22 to 24 weekers, uh, the five minute APCA score was clearly inversely related to rates and risks of death. In the stratum of 25 to 27 weekers, we found the same pattern that mortality rates and risks were higher the lower the score. In the very preterm population, born at 28 to 31 weeks, this pattern of inverse relation was even stronger. As a final step, we also wanted to explore the dynamics, how mortality risks were influenced by changes of APGAR from five to 10 minutes. And thanks to the large data set, we were able to do this by performing stratified analysis in which we slice the data by both gestational age and APGAR score. And again, I will only show a subset of all the uh, results to avoid too many numbers. Uh, so uh, since we applied two stratifications, we needed to group all extremely preterm infants into one stratum and all very preterm infants in one stratum for the sake of statistical power. So what does this table show? Uh, the upper part shows infants with a five minutes, with uh, the upper part shows uh, extremely preterm infants with a five minute score of four to six. And the lower part shows infants with a five minute APCA score of seven to eight. What you can see here is that if the APCA score improved from four to six to seven to eight or nine to 10, the mortality risks were reduced as compared to those who had the same APCA score of four to six at both five and 10 minutes. The same uh, pattern was evident for extremely preterm infants with a five minute score of seven to eight. If APCA score improved to nine to 10 at 10 minutes, the rates and risks were reduced as compared to those with a, sta with a stationary. APCA score. In the very preterm population born at 28 to 31 weeks, the pattern was even stronger or more evident. If the APCA score improved between five and 10 minutes, the rates and risks were much reduced. So, how can we? make AAP come over to our side and think around APCA as not being too bad? Well, that's a question to discuss <laughs> later. And maybe someone from AAP is also in this webinar, so we can have a discussion uh, today. So what are my take home messages? Uh, first of all, I want to uh, uh, um, conclude that we need to acknowledge that Virginia Apgar had in mind a scoring system about short-term assessments, so she didn't think about long-term risk prediction, especially not in preterm infants. However, in term births, the Apgar score is related to risks of death and cerebral palsy in a dose-dependent manner. <clears throat> and in addition, our study of APCAR scoring of preterm infants shows that there is indeed an inverse relation between APCAR score and mortality across all gestational weeks. And furthermore, an improvement in APCAR score at five and 10 minutes is related to a dose dependent reduction in mortality risk. So what do we do with those findings from epidemiological studies? Well, I think we can all agree that we want to predict the future for our preterm infants and the outcomes, good or bad. 
In my opinion, the APGAR score is a very good starting point for this, uh, but we should, of course, aim to go beyond that. Uh, I think we are able to develop prediction models based on the combination of APGAR scores, which is already done by everyone, and together with measurements such as oxygen saturation uh, or data on uh, initial ventilatory support, etc., which is also, by the way, already recorded in many units. Today, there is a lot of buzzwording around artificial intelligence, but I think there is a great potential for smart technologies in this respect. And the bottom line is the same as always, that more research is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, and uh, we will soon be over to Pablo. I, we have got some questions here in our Q&A form, and I just wanted to address that you could please uh, ask questions, and after Pablo's presentation, we will address them. Um, so please, Pablo. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Okay, so can you see my presentation? Is it okay? Yeah, good. Okay, so first of all, thank you all for inviting us to share our beloved project. Um, so um, actually the project is called Incubator. The tree is like a, a exponent, a, like a, it's a little nerd term. Um, so who are we? We are a group of uh, volunteers and enthusiasts that um, we're just uh, engineers, uh, also medical engineers, and uh, also uh, Alejandro and me are the uh, co-directors of, of this project. Actually, Alejandro is the, the founder of, of it, and uh, now he... Um, this project is about life and Alejandro uh, invests in life in all its terms and now he's a father of three. So uh, he contributes in life all he, all he can in the, every manner he, he finds. Uh, so, okay, first, first of all, um, why um, this is the main focus of, the, of this project is this map. Uh, actually, this is the mortality rate uh, of um, prematurity. Um, uh, you can see that in America and Europe, uh, also in, in, in Asia, part of Asia, uh, there are very low uh, mortality rates. And in part, think, uh, thanks for very good neonatologists and people that uh, really uh, makes a huge effort, uh, and I'm sure that uh, partially these rates are uh, thanks for uh, people uh, like you. Um, but there are also other uh, countries that uh, don't have uh, all the uh, um, infrastructure to treat all the uh, infants that, that are born. Um, if we want to, of course, uh, fix this problem, uh, we can um, invest in, in incubators and ship those to those places, but it's not so easy. And um, as you know, this, uh, these incubators are very, very expensive and require, requires also a very professional staff to, to, man to manage uh, the usage of, of these equipments. Uh, so we actually have uh, been traveling to, to Africa. The main countries we visited is are Africa. And we found uh, solutions like this. Uh, they don't have incubators in uh, some of the places we visited. And they usually uh, use some shoe boxes or we even saw uh, in, in one country, we saw uh, babies that they were putting inside uh, pumpkins, they were emptied pumpkins and they were uh, 
fitting babies inside. Uh, it's the best that they thought that they could do. Uh, and so this is like having almost nothing, uh, as you as you may know. Uh, there are also some hospitals that uh, use the kangaroo um, uh, solution to keep the baby a little bit warmer. Um, but also in some places that we visited, uh, the uh, mother actually is not uh, fully available to uh, perform this this the solution. So, uh, okay, like this is much better than having a shoebox, but it's nothing compared to having a professional incubator. So we said, okay, how if we design something very simple that we can uh, offer them to just uh, some kind of alternative. Um, so we started to design a, a proof of concept of uh, how would it be. Um, so this is a plastic enclosure with some 3D printer uh, parts that are really easy to, to manufacture. And also we designed our own electronics to, to run this, um, this solution. And also there are some um, uh, companies here in, in actually, uh, we are in Pamplona in the north of Spain that uh, help us uh, really for free. Uh, it's really nice to, to have some companies like this that are also willing to do some, some good to the world. And there are also some uh, schools that uh, manufacture this incubator for us, uh, some kind of um, practice for, for them. And they are, they are also volunteers in their spare time. And we, be, uh, we are um, doing, uh, we, the solution that we have controls a uh, temperature uh, by controlling the air temperature and also controlling the skin temperature of the, of the newborn. And also we implemented a phototherapy solution uh, which is uh, very cheap for for us to to do um, uh, to include it in the in the design, and uh, there is actually also another NGO that is helping us with the, all the logistics to ship all this uh, equipment to to Africa, and actually we work in this project uh, for free, and also we are. Um, very, uh, we have in mind that uh, there are lives at risk. So also we have put a lot of effort of achieving um, a compliance in the IEC 6601 uh, 60, uh, to assure that uh, we're always uh, helping the baby to uh, survive. And we have not actually um, do the laboratory, the lab laboratory um, testing, but we tested it ourselves uh, in in our facilities. And so, okay, uh, we have something that is uh, an alternative of uh, these two uh, practices that uh, that are common in in Africa, for example. Um, but okay, how? how close is to a professional incubator. So we're going to, I'm going to share with you uh, one of the uh, incubators that we sent. Uh, this is Ebome Hospital in Cameroon. And it's very, very beautiful. It's uh, close to the, to the sea. And for example, in this hospital, you can see that uh, annually, there are more or less uh, 80 children that uh, needs an incubator, okay? Um, so before we send them incubators, this is how um, they manage to uh, help uh, newborns just with a heat source near the baby. And as you may know, um, the most important thing is to uh, achieve a neutral point. So the, all the energy that the baby uh, has uh, will be to grow. Um, so we sent these incubators uh, in just in uh, regular luggage. The, 
uh, it can be fitted in 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 the luggage of uh, someone that uh, goes there and there you go then uh, they have uh, two of these incubators uh, there and one of the most important thing is that statistically 70% uh, of the uh, medical uh, equipment that is sent to uh, Africa 70% uh, doesn't work maybe if, uh, because uh, it is damaged uh, in the shipment maybe because they don't know how to use it so this is why we also included um, connection to to our uh, internet connection uh, in the incubator so we can help them uh, use the, incub the incubator properly for example this is a um, real example of another hospital that uh, this is the room temperature of the incubator and uh, they had the incubators in a room where uh, the sun was uh, heating uh, all the time so it was really hot inside uh, so the incubator uh, as you may know also only increases temperature it cannot decrease uh, temperature inside um, so we just uh, make a phone call and we said to them the, that they have to put the incubator in a more fresh uh, in a cooler uh, room and if we uh, didn't have this service uh, most probably um, they would think that uh, there is something that is not working or something like that and they would it would be um, not used so uh, back again in this Canberra hospital uh, they started to send us pictures of uh, babies inside and um, also triplets uh, which uh, have a uh, nice weight and it, they were just uh, helping them a little bit but then one day uh, we received a, a phone call of a baby just born with 500 grams and they said that um, when uh, children like that is born there uh, they just leave him in a room uh, to just uh, to die because they are not used to um, helping uh, these kind of uh, cases because uh, they thought that there is nothing they can do uh, with the uh, previously when they didn't have an incubator uh, there is nothing they can they could do so they decided to put this baby in the incubator and we also uh, help them um, just making sure that everything is all right and um, one month and a half later they sent me a picture of the baby that he was uh, all right and a few uh, weeks ago i i was able to uh, go there to cameroon and i had the, the gift of meeting Zoe. this is uh, so the baby and also i'm I was very happy to meet the mother that was really, really happy to uh, to meet each other. Um, so we started to ship to uh, a lot of different countries. We have shipped a uh, hundred of units for the moment, and then uh, we are going to ship 100 more uh, before the year ends. And also one important thing that uh, I have to tell is that uh, since we do this uh, in our spare time and we don't um, uh, also earn any money for, for this we just uh, give the incubators for the material cost of, of it and uh, so this uh, incubator cost only 350 euros um, so if you know how, uh, how much in professional incubator cost uh, you may know that this is very very uh, small price or uh, it's not price it's like a donation to to everyone that uh, need this and also this project of course is open source um, everyone can can load the design in our web page and also he can contribute with with the project there are a lot of things that uh, we are uh, thinking to add 
to this incubator uh, or to adapt to other uh, necessities, such as, for example, we are working right now in a pulse oximeter embedded in the own uh, incubator. So we can uh, see the oxygen saturation of the baby and also the, the pulse. And so also we can help them with that, uh, with, with those telemetries from here. Um, also, uh, of course, I invite you to, to help us in, in any, any way you, uh, you think or you, you can. Uh, and even if, if you think, uh, I don't know how to, uh, how to contribute. So uh, this is, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Lucas and Martina that are my, ne my nephews and they are six years old and um, they didn't know how to contribute with the, with the project. So uh, they very happily, and uh, this was by themselves, uh, they told her uh, their colleagues uh, in their school about the project, and uh, they were really happy to to talk about it in in the school. So I also invite you to to let this project uh, uh, share to share this project to everyone that uh, may need it, or just to tell them about uh, the effort we do of uh, some of the people here in in, in Spain. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you, for, for inviting us uh, to tell you about uh, our project that we really love. And yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Um, I think we have uh, at least uh, a couple of questions. I know I have questions as well. Uh, we should maybe start with a question for Stefan. Um, there was a, start, a question here about when to start counting counting time in APGAR score, cord clamping, head delivery, or or all body out. Uh, would you like to answer that, Stefan? Sorry, there is no sound, Stefan. So at least uh, the way we do it is that we start counting when the old baby is born. Uh, so when, yeah. I, I I don't know about practices in other countries, but I think this is at least the regular, the most common uh, uh, strategy. Uh, you are muted. Ah, you are muted, <laughs> Gustav. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Uh, and Pablo, how uh, how is it? How do you choose which which hospitals you um, work with? Okay, that's a nice question. Um, we have a lot of more, a lot more, um, uh, like we can only manufacture 100 a, a year. That's uh, the uh, schools here in, in Spain the, uh, that uh, can help us with that. Um, and there are a lot of orders, uh, uh, almost like a thousand per year, something like that. So we have to study the most needed, uh, we have to rank in some way the most needed uh, places. So um, some of the things we we rank, for example, if uh, is for example uh, if they have a professional staff to use these incubators, also if they have, for example, uh, oxygen uh, therapy, if uh, they have maintenance uh, staff to uh, uh, fix anything that may break, for example. Um, so just yes, then we rank uh, every order and we decide um, where to send them. There is um, absolutely just loads of um, praise, I guess, for your work, <laughs> Pablo, in the chat. Just lots of people going, heat for babies, that's a cool idea. <laughs> and that it's brilliant and it's fantastic work. Um, and, you know, just huge kind of congratulations to you and your team, I guess. And I think, um, well, there's a, so there's, a, mm, there's a few things. So I think, first of all, Stefan has got quite a lot of questions for you, Pablo. And then, um, and then we'll come back to the Q and A because there's a, a question for Stefan in there, but Stefan, why don't you start with your questions? 
and then yeah. we'll get to the participant question. <laughs> oh, uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate you. A fantastic project. This is exactly what uh, we have been trying to do with 99 EQ from the beginning, to do something for the greater good and without thinking too much about all the implications around it. But I was thinking, have you been thinking around uh, uh, engaging with um, a party like Bill Gates Foundation or WHO or some other partner that would be able to scale up? Uh, because I, I fully agree that skin to skin care is so important in especially the developing context, but there's clearly a role for this kind of simple DIY devices and so on. Yes. Um, so we are now very focused on learning uh, in the field uh, because uh, something that we didn't think of is how different we are, uh, for example, in my case, uh, Europe and Africa, the culture, how different it is. So we are focusing a lot on uh, helping them using incubators. We found that a lot of places, even though they had um, professional staff, um, sometimes they don't have like the, the just simple things to, to use uh, the incubators. So we are learning a lot and we are changing a lot of uh, things to um, make the, um, a device that is perfect for, for them. And, one of the things is, is this um, internet connection that uh, it's really helping them. And of course, we, are, uh, we also uh, thought about scaling up the project. Um, for example, uh, uh, if we have um, better networking, uh, for example, with Bill Gates Foundation or something like that, it would be also interesting for us. So if you have uh, something that can introduce us it would be very helpful um yes uh, we also we are uh, trying to scale it up uh, but maybe uh, in the manufacturing there are also some uh, companies here in spain that are willing to help us with the design to make it more easy to manufacture to um yes things like that Um, following on maybe from that, um, there is a question about um, whether or not you've considered to use solar energy in your next version of your genius but simple incubator. So yeah, any thoughts about solar energy? <laughs> yes, so um, we think about it. Um, we one of the also one of the benefits of this incubator is that it consumes very little power. Um, only like 100 watts, something like that, uh, is the the average consumption. Uh, even less in if um, if the room temperature is uh, a little high. So, for example, with just a solar panel, we can um, we can supply like two or three incubators. So it's uh, really easy. But the um, uh, main and actually that's uh, I work. Uh, this is like my free time uh, project, but I work on a company uh, called IED here in the northern part of Spain. And uh, we are developing just uh, the, uh, this solution, a solar panel for developing countries that is very robust because what we saw is that, uh, for example, the government um, places solar panels in houses or, or in, in um, in a hospital or something like that. And if you leave it like that, uh, you will uh, come back next year and all the solar panels, maybe uh, they sold them in the, in the market for uh, just a little bit of money or something like that. So it's very important to um, keep a product that is robust, that is controlled, and we're working on it, on it yes. So exciting. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, someone, um, Abdul from Pakistan, um, ex, you know, says that he um, experiences firsthand the high neonatal mortality rates and is completely excited by your idea 
um, and hopes to collaborate with you in that regard. So perhaps we can share some contact details um, sure. after the event. Um, but you might suddenly get really busy in your spare time, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, there's a question for Stefan about, do you video record resuscitations of preterm babies? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, there was a project about this um, some years ago about like blinded video recording of the resuscitation table but there were quite a number of um, uh, issues if I may say so related to GDPR and ethics and consent and things like this so we don't do it but I think this is done in some uh, units in Europe that I've heard about uh, for auditing reasons uh, and this would also uh, enable uh, uh, better APCA scoring, <laughs> probably, but also uh, getting data for prediction, because I think a lot of the things that we do very early in life of, uh, of a preterm infant is predictive of what's going to happen. Uh, so that's a short answer to this. And another question here for Stefan. Um, in the extremely premature, if you look at 22 to 24 weeks, would you say that you would expect an APGAR of 10 uh, at 10 minutes? Or what is the normal APGAR score? Oh, that's uh, also a very good question. APGAR scoring in, in preterm infants. So um, I would say it's probably possible to have a very high APGAR score, even in a very immature baby. Uh, and the reason, and uh, with the, uh, uh, the understanding that the tone of a super tiny baby, a normal tone of a very tiny baby, isn't re really the same as the tone of a term four kilo baby. Uh, so one needs to make some kind of, uh, I think everyone setting up in preterm infants have some kind of reference, what is the expected tone of a 24-weeker, for example, and give two points for tone, if that aligns, so to say. But um, uh, we, uh, we have also been like playing around because we have a data set where we have the com the sub components of APGAR. So, what is the APGAR of tone, heart rate, respiration, and so on? And it seems that, uh, at least in term infants, we were only able to do this in term infants. And it seems that respiration and the heart rate and the color seems to be the most important uh, sub components of the APGAR score. But um, uh, yeah, that was a slight deviation from the original question. I realize this now, but uh, uh, I think it's possible uh, to have a representative uh, or a generalizable APGAR score, despite all, despite all the limitations around inter-user variability and so on. Uh, that's uh, And maybe it's more important to see the trend over the course of time from one to five to 10 minutes rather than the single digit, uh, so to say, or the single number. Uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting, actually, the data about the chain, the infographic data. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, if anyone has got any more questions um, for either Pablo or Stefan, please do put them. Oh, there's another one just appeared in my chat. That's excellent. Um, so another APGO scoring um, question is, um, which sort of links to what I was going to ask you actually, Stefan, is, is the predictive value of APGO scoring in preterm babies mm. better if you combine it with cord pH? And I think I was going to ask if there are, you know, we say more research is needed, like really yeah. blasé, don't we? And actually, <laughs> you know, yeah. can we be more specific? You know, are there components that you think <clears throat> could be added to the APGAR score of preterm infants to make it uh, better? Maybe. Uh, we've also done some exploratory work uh, of metabolic acidosis and acidosis as such, and APGAR scoring in term infants. And it's not, um, 
adding so much in predictive modeling, uh, I would say, which is quite interesting because we often think that uh, um, the metabolic fatigue of, or the fatigue from uh, running out of uh, uh, energy reserves and so on is very important for terminus. So I think for preterm infants, maybe there are other uh, pathophysiological components that can be as important uh, than just uh, energy drain, so to say. But uh, uh, it remains to be determined. Uh, I would, I mean, if we would think around the future of prediction and scoring, I think uh, maybe there are other uh, factors that come slightly later than the immediate birth moment. For example, uh, uh, the need of uh, mechanical ventilation or uh, development of RDS, uh, yes, no, or surfactant, yes, no, or uh, maybe some inflammatory markers. I think those kind of data that we all have for most babies, because we take all the blood samples and we know what we're doing and what we're measuring and so on. I think those kind of data analysis should be put into some machine learning thing <laughs> and help us make better predictions. Uh, and I think uh, with all, because we're collecting so much data in the NICU on scoring charts and in computer systems and um, in the equipment uh, collects a lot of data. And if we could have some kind of incorporation into some automated feedback and then adding the outcome one, two, three, five years later into this algorithm, I think we should be able to make much better predictions than we do today. Thank you. And I think uh, we have time for one more question. So I, I have one for you, Pablo. Uh, and that's it. That is, uh, do you have any neonatologists uh, working with you today in uh, developing your project? As for me, I have no experience working in developing countries, but I do see that we have at least one attendee who's been working with uh, Doctors Without Borders in parts of Africa. Um, uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we work with some uh, neonatologists from uh, here from Pamplona in Spain. And also, uh, there is a nurse in in uh, that work with incubators that also uh, help us uh, with uh, the design and little things that we can do um, better for uh, helping these countries. But um, we are very open to anyone that wants to um, help us and to give us new ideas. So yes, feel free and welcome. Great to hear. So Pablo, I have an idea. Okay, uh, yes. There was a Swedish company and their business was to sell stars to people. So you could buy a star in the sky and you had like a diploma sent to this person. It was like 50 euros. So quite expensive in my opinion. And I think you should be having like a, uh, that people could support your project by like, buying an incubator that is shipped somewhere and the person who buys the incubator knows where it's going yes we're um, working in in that and actually there is um also uh i don't know if this is very uh, popular sport here in in, in spain but uh, i don't know if you know uh, paddle the the sport um is uh, so a very famous uh, paddle player um supported us with an incubator uh, she's called Marta Ortega and uh, we are going to share with her uh, her incubator actually he, her incubator is in Ukraine and she can uh, also see uh, like some of the of the telemetries of, of the incubator and uh, she can know where and how many uh, children is is saving so uh, I just thank you Thank you for for the idea, and we in in the few weeks we implemented it. That's it's just so inspiring. <laughs> how and how a telecoms engineer has ended up in the neonatal world, but 
that's a conversation for another time. Um, so I think we're probably um, all, all done with questions. Um, so I will just kind of draw it all to a close really, I guess by um, thanking, you know, our partnering companies, so Neo Neobiomics and also the NGO that we've heard so much about, Medical Open World, um, for joining and supporting our fourth and final webinar in our Neovation series. Um, and obviously we'd also really like to thank our speakers, um, Stefan and Pablo, for sharing their expertise and their ideas. Um, but last but not least, we'd like to thank all of our participants who have joined um, our preceding kind of webinars, but also this fourth and final webinar. Um, you know, feel free, please go to the 99niku.org um, page if you're not already signed up, um, you know, where you can share your expert expertise with other neonatal healthcare professionals from around the world um, and also kind of connect with each other um, and find out more about um, details of future webinars and also future meetups. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, the recording will be um, available on YouTube um, soon, um, so you can always catch up um, with it at that point. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.